One of the joys that I have is to be able to come into God's house and worship with his people. It is something that in all honesty is in my, in my context, it's one of the best days of my week. Uh, Y'all know I officiate football, so I know nobody's gonna be yelling at me. Um, I, I, I don't have to worry about throwing a flag on any of y'all that I'm aware of. I'll let the Holy Spirit and God do that. Um, but let me ask you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, the book of Acts. I've been doing some reflecting and um, I want us to look at chapter 16. And I've got a quote that y'all have heard me use before. And the quote that I've used before is this. Everybody does what they want to do, and then they find a reason or excuse for doing it. Well, I've modified that a little bit. Everyone does what they want to do by value and importance. If something is valuable to us, we'll go in that direction. If it's important to us, we will do it. Now, I believe that you have come here today not to hear Ron Etheridge, I don't think that y'all came here out of habit. I prefer to know and think that you came here today for the main purpose and reason to encounter God and to hear from him. And so that's my prayer whenever we get to this part in worship. And I hope you, 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 you agree with me that, that worship is not confined to 11 o'clock to approximately 12 noon on a Sunday, that it's a lot bigger and, and comprehensive than that. And what I want us to do is to read beginning in Acts chapter 16. We're going to pick up in verse 16. And we're going to look at a, a, a passage that is familiar um, and I titled the message, This Doesn't Make Sense. And I think you'll understand that once we get into it. And by the way, this passage of scripture is also where I got the title for the book that we have been looking at on Sunday nights, which is Dancing in the Dungeon is the title of the book. It comes from this passage. But let's read together Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. Now, this is about Paul and Silas, and one of them is, in fact, I think Silas is the one who actually writes this section of Scripture because of the way it starts out at the very beginning. He writes, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out. Now, now, and I think for just a minute, we're talking about a woman who was, who was demon-possessed. And I want you to look at what she says, this demon says through her. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, you'd figure if somebody's doing that, you would, you know, hey, thank you, appreciate the, the kudos, but I want you to notice the continuation. And this she kept doing for many days. And I love this next part. It lets me know I'm normal and I'm human. Paul, having become greatly annoyed. Can I get an amen? Has anybody just ever annoyed you? Well, here's Paul, a, a, an apostle who is preaching the gospel. There's somebody that is following them around, really, really proclaiming the gospel itself. But she gets on his nerves and, and here's, look at what happens. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, notice that, not the girl, to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. 
And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. Now, that's not the truth. What they're doing is they're just losing their income. And so they're trying to do a political uh, move here. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering that the jailer keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison, the dungeon, and fastened their feet into stocks. I love verse 25. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and what? Singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds was unfastened. This is such an awesome passage because what we are seeing happen here doesn't make sense. It is not the way we would, we would process things ourselves if we were unjustly thrown into jail or into a prison, into the, into the uh, uh, what do they call solitary confinement, so to speak, and after being beaten and after having their clothes ripped off, all this stuff, and yet what are they doing at midnight? They're, 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 what's the first thing they're doing? Praying. Praying. And what's the second thing? Singing. Singing. And by the way, do you remember what the apostles did after the Passover meal when they were going to the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you remember when they got through with the Passover meal? What did they do? Sing. They sang a hymn. And so what I want us to see here, what I want us to talk about today is the importance and the power of God in worship. I can remember something very similar to this when I was a pastor in Oxford, Alabama. There was a formerly Muslim gentleman who came to me and said that he wanted to be baptized. His name was Sali Solomon. And I asked him, as I do with everyone who requests baptism, I said, well, tell me about your conversion. And he said, well, I was born in Saudi Arabia. I, no, Egypt. I was born in Egypt. And my parents sent me to a Catholic school in uh, Great Britain or somewhere in Europe. And he said, when it came time for worship, of course, all the Muslims had their prayer rugs, I think is what they call them. And they bowed toward Mecca and they would pray. But he said, I could hear the Christians singing. He said, we never sang in worship. And when I would hear them singing, it was such a beautiful thing. And I heard what they were singing. And he said, that's how God led me to Jesus Christ was through the worship of kids in another part of the school. Worship is powerful, is what we say. Worship is powerful. Worship moves us. There's something about the singing of hymns and just music in general that will move us quicker than just about any mess. There are some songs I hear the opening chord and it affects me already. When I'm listening to a message, I got to get into it. And I'll tell you, the messages that I listen to, if they're not hitting my, my heart within about five minutes, guess what I do? Change them, turn them off. <laughs> but y'all can't do that, can you? So anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> Worshiping God takes us to his throne and it shifts the focus of our heart and mind from this world to the one who will be able, who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we ask or imagine. And there's another part of worship that I want us to remember is that Satan and demons cannot handle it when we worship. Amen. They can't. They flee. That's why it's a good thing for us to worship and praise and honor and glorify God. That is a, that's one thing they cannot handle 
if you can imagine them putting their hands over their ears and screaming and running away, that's what worship does to the evil spirits around us. But I want you to notice something. I am not going to define worship by the kind of music we sing. What kind of music in worship is okay to sing? Whatever glorifies God. Can you use a drum? If we had one. What, what about a violin or a fiddle? Well, could, could you use a piano, an organ? Could you use, yes. It, what, what type of song do you, I'm gonna tell you something. If, 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 if I could bring the kind of worship music, I, if we could do the worship music that, that I like, there's some of y'all that would go, what is he listening to? But it's things, I have a, what do they call it? Eclectic. I am so eclectic in my, in my love of worship styles that you cannot put me into any category because it's not about the style, it is about the matter of the heart. So Paul and Silas were going to pray and that's when this girl came out who could tell the future and she began telling everybody that they were servants of God and the way of salvation. She did this apparently for day after day after day. And Paul had finally had enough. And he tells her, in essence, shut up, tells the demon in her to hush, to shut up, to be cast out. Now, I want to make just a very quick aside. There is still demonic activity in possession today. We can't see it and discern it all the time, but we are, I, I promise you, Satan has not changed his MO and he still does it the same way, even to the point of a demon in a person proclaiming the gospel. I mean, that is a powerful thing for us to, to keep in mind here. And by the way, all forms of divination are evil, um, including what are, what are those little things when you go to an Asian place and it's got a, it's fortune, got a who? Fortune. fortune cookie. Yeah, a fortune cookie. Yeah, you know, but the only reason I get fortune cookies is to give them to my dog. Okay? But horoscopes, you know, there's some people that live by those. And they are evil and are not to be played with. So anyway, the girl's owners got mad because she was making them money. And when she was saved, when the demon was cast out of her, all of a sudden they lost their form of income. And when you look at verses 22 through 24, the crowd attacked them. The officials tore off their clothes and beat them with rods and threw them into the prison dungeon, putting them in chains and their feet in stocks. And what do Paul and Silas do? What's the first thing they do? Let's not, let's not buzz by this. What's the first thing that is recorded they did? They prayed. That is our first go-to in any situation, no matter how joyful or how far down it is or how hard it is, is to go to God in prayer. And that, that is our way of communicating with God and God communicating with us. The Holy Spirit will enliven our hearts and our minds and our, our spirits when we are in the attitude and when we are in the practice of praying. And that's what Paul and Silas had done here is they prayed. It's like in 2 Chronicles 20, 12. Write that one down. 2 Chronicles 20, 12. And it's written in that verse of scripture. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And a lot of times that's where we are in the midst of a situation when it rises up. We may not know what to do. So the first place we need to be going is to God Almighty himself. And we approach him with prayer and then we worship. We read his scripture. All those things compile together. And God, uh, God is a a loving God, and when he hears and sees his children doing that, he always responds. So whatever we go through, we seek God. How, how many of y'all are as frustrated as I am that we've got all these tanker ships off the West Coast and we can't get stuff? My, my, my windshield has been cracked for six weeks now, and I still don't have a 
what's that called? The windshield to, to get in because they say we can't get things. Things, it's, it's, it's come to a grinding halt. Our nation, when I look at the decisions that are being made, it is so frustrating because I believe them not just to be wrong, but they're against God. When you're defunding the police, which is God's way of, of restraining evil through the government and they're trying to do those things, it's not good. And so when we have situations, and I think about my grandchildren growing up in this world. Oh my goodness. It, it just, it troubles me. So what am I to do? I go to God. I go to God through prayer. And not only that, I also worship. Now I want you to notice that worship comes after prayer. It is the expression, prayer is the expression of our relationship with God and it will facilitate worship. That is why every Sunday we begin with prayer. And I hope you notice and listen that when I pray, it begins with praise and adoration and glorifying of God because that is the, the main thing we are here to do. It, the main thing is to glorify and honor God no matter what. Because what we are all doing, I, I want you, I really want us to get this, is that we are all here for an audience of one. Amen. We're here for an audience of one. I don't preach what I preach to make y'all feel good or any of those kind of things. I preach the gospel to glorify God. We sing songs to glorify God. We pray to glorify God. And so the, the, the whole goal is, is to lift God, to, our praises to be lifted up to God so that when we leave here, we are strengthened in our inner person and can go out into an evil world and live it in such a way that he is glorified out there. That's why we do what we do here. Now, by prayer, we cast our anxieties on God and we shift our heart from here to heaven. Jot this verse down, Colossians chapter three, verse two. You have heard it before. You've heard me quote it. I want to keep going back so you see it. But Paul writes in Colossians chapter three, verses one and two, is to set your mind on things above and not things on earth where moth and rust corrupt and destroy. We are to set our mind through worship, through prayer, through uh, singing and all these other forms is to actually set our minds on heaven regardless of whatever situation we are in. And I'm going to tell you something that will transform you in whatever situation you're in. That is why the old, and this is what they have always been called, the old Negro spirituals had a lot, a lot, a lot about heaven because they didn't have a whole lot, if anything, on earth. And when we can get our perspective out of what is happening in this little bubble and understand we are eternal beings that are going to be with an eternal God in heaven forever, which, by the way, heaven is on earth, we will tr be transformed in the way we think and the way we process life. Now look at verse 25. It says the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I, whenever I read scripture, I always try to kind of put myself in there. I've tried to think, I wonder what those guys thought. You know, what is, what, you know, what are, what's wrong with these guys? I mean, are, aren't they, they got beat. I mean, look at them. They don't have any clothes on. They're chained to the wall. Their feet are in stocks. And they're praying and singing him. What is wrong with them? Either they're crazy or I want what they got. See, that, that's what happens when we live our faith out there. That there will be people that will see us and it will either offend and they'll go away or they'll be intrigued and come to find out more. That's why we live the way we live in everything we do in the rest of the week. This is just a huddle. I mean, this is football season. I, everything in my mind right now goes back to a huddle. Do you know where the huddle came from? My, my mom and Pam do. You know where the huddle came from? There was a deaf school up in New York that when they played football, they had to figure out a way so that everybody on their, 
on their team knew what play to run, so they would all come around and get around the huddle, and the quarterback would do sign language, and then they would all know what to do. That's where the huddle came from. Then they break the huddle. I don't think they clap, but they break the huddle, and then they go run the play. This is a huddle. So that when we're through, we break it, and we go play the, the, the game out in the world. So Paul and Silas, what was happening is they were living Philippians 1.27. Don't turn there. Let me quote it to you from the NIV. This is Philippians 1.27 in the NIV. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. That is my gray armband. I have had this gray armband on. I think this one is nine years. And it's not for anybody else to see. It's for me to be reminded that whatever happens, I'm to conduct myself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And that's what they are doing right here. So what we have as a result is that these guys were worshiping God and the other pr prisoners took notice and that what they were doing had a spirit-filled, God-centered, Christ-exalting worship. That's what we're to have here. And people notice they sometimes are confused and drawn to God. But in the scripture, what happened as they were singing praises to God? What took place geologically? An earthquake. What would you say? Oh, well, yeah, they, they were doing that by their conduct. You're right. But an earthquake happened. And what happened? It wasn't just an earthquake. I mean, everybody had shackles on, and what happened to the shackles? <laughs> Fell off. And I don't know if they were behind bars or whatever, but whatever was keeping them in, what happened to those? They opened. Do you know what happened right there that they did not see that is not recorded here? Angels did all that. Angels came and they went, took off the shackles and opened all the doors. And all of a sudden, they thought the, the jailer came out. This is in verse 27. He came out when the earthquake happened and when he saw the doors open, he thought to himself, I'm dead. Because that's what happened. If somebody escaped from a Roman guard, they killed the guard. But everybody was still there. Paul stopped him because he said, no one is going to escape. But then God glorified himself by saving that jailer and here's that's the story that's the background what i want to suggest to us all is that worship of god is freeing and i want us to remember that worship is not powerful but the god we worship is all powerful it's just like prayer prayer is not powerful but the god who answers prayer is all powerful so when we worship, it's not our worship that necessarily changes lives. It is the power of God that we worship that responds in that context that it helps us and it intrigues and draws others closer to Christ himself, if not even for salvation. But let me turn things a little bit. Our worship assigns great value to who we worship. And by the way, you do know that everybody worships. It's just a matter of what or who you worship. But everybody worships. If you ever, have you ever seen a concert or been to a concert? Anybody? Yeah, you have? Okay. That is worship. The problem is, and I see this mostly with, with rock concerts, they are, in essence, worshiping the guys on stage or, or ladies. That's, that's what all that emotion is really boiled down to. It is a false worship. But when we come together, we must understand that the motivation for our worship is God and who he is. The problem we have in many of our congregations, and I'll be honest enough to say there are times where it's me, is that I'm just not ready for it. I'm just not into it. I come here and what I do is I sing the songs, you know, sing the songs, preach the word, and it's just going through the motions. I'll tell you, well, I, I think personally, haven't done a, a survey or anything, 
But I think one of the reasons a lot of people don't put a high priority on Sunday worship in the congregation is God is just not that important to them. I can remember, now I'm not going to tell you this story. I ask, I ask a, de a demon, I ask a demon, I've meant deacon. <laughs> I'm sorry. I ask a deacon in another congregation that is not in this part of the state why he didn't come on Sunday night. And you know what he said? I don't get anything out of it. As if worship were to center around him. When we come to worship, it's to glorify God. It's not about us. It's about the love that we have for the God who saved us. We worship the God who saved us because he has freed us, delivered us, and he is the one who brings us to eternity before him. And what we're trying to do here is to just get a little bit of a preview of what we're going to be doing forever. I'm going to tell you something. If you have ever been in a real spirit-filled worship service, you will not mind worshiping forever in heaven because that is a unique and powerful situation. And I can, the, the most powerful God moment that I have personally ever experienced was in Atlanta, it was in the, I forget what they called it at that time, but it was the, the place where they play all the SEC football games and all that. And it was complete silence. We had spent time in worship. We had spent time in praising God through the proclamation of the word. And then we prayed and the leader, it was Chuck Swindoll who was preaching. He said, I want everyone to just stop for a moment and seek God through prayer. And I have never in my life felt the presence of God more powerfully than in that moment of silence with 60,000 other people. When we come to the house of God, it's to encounter him. And a lot of people don't know God well enough nor care about him to come and worship with their brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why a congregation will have a membership role of 120 will come. That's about the average, by the way. 20% of church members attend on any given Sunday. That's why it's not that big of a deal to say, you know what, I'm kind of sore this morning and not come. And, and I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's like that, that time um, where a guy woke up one morning and said he just didn't feel like going to church. He was going to stay home. Uh, it, it just wasn't worth going that Sunday. And his wife looked at him and said, but you're the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> We're human, guys. And we recognize those times when we're weak and but dust. And I will say this, there are times when physically people can't attend. That's why we do the little YouTube thing. <coughs> and God understands that when we can't come. But I, can, I can't help but remember people who were in the midst of chemotherapy and were in worship. I thought, I just, it just beat me up. It just beat me up to see. I can remember, it was, this one was at Woodward Avenue. The lady was having uh, cancer treatment. She sat on the right side, and we were singing Amazing Grace, tears coming down her face, and she's praising God with her hands up. She wasn't there for Ron. I knew it. She was there for God. And I've wondered, is that why no more people that say they're believers come on a regular basis? Look, I'm not saying we have to be in church every Sunday. I'm saying that we will come as we're able according to our physical abilities and strength to worship God. Whatever we worship is who we sign great worth to. Some people for worship of God is not passionate, but then I can't help but think of John chapter four, verse 23, write this one down. Don't have time to turn there. And John four twenty-three. here's what Jesus says. 
The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father, and here it is, here's the quote you know, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Did you notice it didn't say in church? It didn't say in church. Can, can worship take place outside church? Yes. Where is the best place for worship to take place? in God's house, in a congregation. But you can worship anywhere, anytime. When I, last year, I was standing on the sideline at um, Phil Campbell, and uh, it had rained, and I looked up, and there was a moon and a rainbow. And I couldn't help but turn around to the coach and say, Coach, you see that? He goes, yeah. I said, God did that. I took a little time to worship, on a sideline. I, I have taken the kids when they were younger, we'd be going somewhere and there would be the beautiful sunset or sunrise, that wasn't very often, but sunsets were. And I would say, who did that? And they'd say, God did. And we would spend a little bit of time in worship. We can worship anywhere, anytime. We can worship in our, laying in our bed with a fever of 102, listening to, to music. <laughs> worship is not confined to just right here because worship is always right here. And so that's why I encourage us to always, when we have opportunity and can come here together and worship, but let's worship God all week. And I'll guarantee you that will transform our lives. My goodness, y'all got to listen quicker. Here we go. If we believe about God, that he is the almighty God, that he is all powerful, that he is omniscient, that he is omnipresent, all those things. If we believe that about God, we will worship him. Singing songs expresses what is in our heart about God. Nature uh, expresses, seeing nature, like I just told you, is an expression of worship. And I, I've, I've told y'all before, I, and I've told my kids, Pam and mom know this, that if they ever want to see me, pre if they ever want to see me worship, it's while I'm preaching. I worship the most while I'm preaching because I'm getting to proclaim the truth, the eternal truth of God to his people for them to hear and for them to glorify God in their lives. <coughs> Let me tell you though about a guy. His name was David. This is by the way in 2 Samuel 12. David had an affair with Bathsheba. And she became a child. So what did David do? He killed her husband. And then when the baby was born, God told him, one of the punishments on you is that the baby will die. And so at that point, when he found that out, that he went to the house of, the, of God and he got on his face before God and he prayed and prayed and fasted and prayed and fasted. And then the baby died. His servants were afraid because they said, if this is what he's doing while the baby's alive, what in the world is going to happen when, we, when he finds out what's taking place? Well, David heard him talk and he went up to him and says, has the baby died? And they, they said, yes. You know what David did? He got up, he went and cleaned himself up and went to the house of God and worshiped. And they went to him and said, what are you doing? When the baby was alive, you were, you were all broken up and busted up and, and you were praying and you were prostrating and you were, you, were, you were fasting. And then the baby dies, you get up and you go worship, why? And he said, I shall return to him, but he will not return to me. So David had a perspective about heaven and worship that we, I think, need to gather. I can remember a family in, again in Oxford, whose daughter committed suicide on Christmas Eve, and their son committed suicide, I think, two or three months later, and they never missed a worship Sunday. They wept through them the whole time, but they were in God's house every single Sunday. Do you know why? 
They felt a closeness to God in the congregation of the people than they did anywhere or any time else. That's the way Christians are. You think about David, you think about Paul and Silas, and you wonder, can that be us? And I want to tell you, yes. Then no matter what happens in our life, we can praise and worship and glorify God. We can be joyful and happy from the inside out. The question for us is, is do we value God? Do we love him? Do we worship God for who he is, period? Not for what he gives us, not for anything else, but because of who he is. And so I guess the way that I came to a conclusion here is to ask myself, do I have a, ver a view of God of him being of more worth than anything else? Because if he is, I will worship him regardless of situations. My request of each of us is when we go home this afternoon, take a little time of evaluation and, and see where you are in your relationship to God. I'm not asking you whether or not you're saved, although that might be the case. But I'm asking you is do we need to get closer to him? And the answer is always yes. And when that happens, I promise you, you will have a joy that nothing in this life can rattle. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you. And you have given us story after story after story that are, that are all true in the scriptures about your people who worshiped, honored, and glorified you. And how not only did you do mighty things, but you brought people into the kingdom and your name was glorified. So Father, I would ask for each person here and for each family that is represented that we will all put a greater and higher value on you than we did yesterday and that tomorrow will be greater than it is today. We ask, Father, that you glorify your name in all things, knowing that you will, but Father, we love you and we want to see it ourselves. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Joel.